Hello everyone. Welcome to the Lightning Ball channel. If you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please do so and activate the notification bell. Your support fuels my continued efforts. In our previous episode, while Rimuru attended the World Conference, Michael's forces launched a three-pronged attack. Felwe and Vega infiltrated in Gracia Kingdom, intending to assassinate Masayuki, while the Gruul's brother Fen and others attacked Heaven Tower. In this episode, we focus on Malim's country, where Carrera, Malim, and their allies face an invasion by the massive insect army. Let's get started. At the same time as wars erupted in various regions, a massive swarm of insects appeared on the horizon of Malim's territory. Everyone fell silent and turned pale as the ground and sky filled with magical insects, presenting a threat far greater than anticipated. Even more terrifying, Abra noticed that all eight insect generals under Insect Lord Zelenus had mobilized. Previously, we mentioned that out of the twelve insect generals, only eight remained, with Razel and Manaza killed by Xi'an, and Zijin and Apito now serving under Rimuru. The full deployment of the remaining insect generals signaled that Zelenus was fully committed to this battle. Faced with such a formidable enemy, even the usually spirited Abra fell silent. However, Abra's silence was mainly due to her aversion to insects. When the three mystic admirals were assigning tasks, she had preferred defending against the perilous evil god Ivaraj rather than confronting insected monsters. Malim, as carefree and unconcerned as ever, asked Frey if she could use Dragonova to blow away the enemies. Frey, deep in thought, realized that this plan wasn't bad. Wiping out a significant portion of the enemy with a single strike was indeed tempting. However, Frey had a bad feeling about it. Using their most potent attack immediately might be tactically sound, but exposing their trump card without knowing the enemy's abilities seemed unwise. Frey vaguely dismissed Malim's proposal. Unlike the others, she was well aware of the insector's formidable nature, having fought Sejin and Apito in Ramorous Labyrinth. Although Frey managed to defeat Apito in the end, she knew Zijin was on a different level. Carrion agreed with Frey stating that it was wise not to underestimate the enemy and to proceed with caution. Midray suggested that the key targets in the opposing army were their commanders. If they could eliminate them, the rest of the insected army would become disorganized. After some discussion, they decided that Frey and her forces would handle the flying insect swarms in the sky while Midray, Carrion, and their troops would take on the ground forces. Abra would serve as Malim's guard. Malim laughed heartily easing the tension, and expressed her eagerness to see her big four in action. Frey, however, wasn't keen on Malim adopting Ramura's idea of having a big four. More precisely, Frey didn't want Malim to be too influenced by Ramuru. Frey thought a more modest title would be better, but Malim firmly rejected this idea, insisting that she needed to catch up with Ramuru in this aspect. Seeing Malim's playful demeanor, the others decided not to argue further. Let's analyze Malim's military strength. Starting with the commanders, after Frey and Carrion submitted to Malim, her territory became the largest among the Octogram Demon Lords, naturally making her military power formidable. Carrion and Frey, now super-awakened beings, took on significant roles, Carrion as the supreme general commanding the entire army and Frey as the head of Malim's guard. Midray, the great priest, led the warrior monk priests as rear support, while Abra was the strategist, responsible for devising battle plans. As for the army, Carrion commanded the Flying Beast Knights, an elite unit composed of the elite warriors of the former Beast Kingdom led by three Beast Katirs, along with remnants of Clayman's forces and regular warriors from the Beast Kingdom, totaling around 100,000 soldiers. Malim's guard, led directly by Frey, consisted of over 3,000 Sky Knights, with a collective combat power exceeding A rank, including several capable of matching special A rank. Next were the rear guard volunteers, represented by Midray but actually commanded by Hermes, comprising wandering magents, human mercenaries, and some former subordinates of Clayman. This diverse, mixed unit focused on combat support tasks. Although their strength ranged from D rank to B rank, and their temperaments were not suited for battle, they boasted a size of over 100,000 troops. Additionally, the Monster Federation provided reinforcements, 
most notably Geld's yellow and orange core. Originally gathered for urban construction, they were pressed into the emergency situation, adding 35,000 soldiers to the front lines. Within this group, the high orcs under Geld's command had seen significant combat power increases following Geld's evolution. The number of core members had grown to 10,000, with numerous A-rank warriors among them. Specializing in defense, they were an impenetrable shield, earning a fearsome reputation. Gabra led 200 members of the Hiryu, all possessing special A-rank combat power. Lastly, although only two in number, Carrera and Esprit possessed terrifying combat abilities. These combined forces formed Malim's army to face insect Lord Zelenus's vast army, but it promised to be a tough battle. The enemy's numbers were over ten times, exceeding three million, with insected monsters swarming the skies and charging forth relentlessly. And so, the battle began. The first to take action was our primordial yellow, Carrera. Since Malim's request for the strongest attack had been refused by Frey, it was an opportunity for the explosive Carrera to shine. Carrera eagerly stepped forward, with Malim laughing heartily, akin to a fan club supporter. Somehow, these two had become good friends, constantly learning from each other and enhancing their strength. Their shared belief was simple. Power was proven by destruction, and the stronger the destruction, the greater the proof of power. Straightforward and impulsive, Carrera unhesitatingly unleashed her most powerful nuclear magic, Abyss Annihilation. Accompanied by a devastating strike from the sky, over two million insected monsters were annihilated instantly, reducing the original tenfold numerical disparity to about fourfold. Witnessing this, the soldiers, who had been despairing over the vast difference in combat power, now showed expressions of hope. Carrera's actions, though somewhat reckless, were ultimately the most morale-boosting approach, preserving their own strength and raising their warriors' fighting spirit. As a result, the situation quickly turned in their favor. This should have been the case. However, as everyone was excited, Frey's uneasy premonition became a reality. A mysterious force effortlessly redirected Carrera's immense magical attack to the other world. One insect general had altered the trajectory of Carrera's magic. The caster was Peleid, one of the twelve insect generals, an insector with long, brightly colored wings and a female appearance. The insect race possessed extremely high magic resistance, capable of even nullifying magic, making them natural enemies to the magic specializing demon race. However, simply redirecting Carrera's strongest attack wasn't everything. Carrera realized this, her smile fading as she instructed Geld to release a protective barrier toward the sky with all his might. Although the reason was unclear, Geld swiftly obeyed without hesitation. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Esprit also took action, deploying defensive magic to reinforce Geld's barrier. As Frey watched their actions in confusion, the sky twisted and warped. Just as Carrera had anticipated, a destructive energy mass emerged from the rift, the very same abyss annihilation spell that Carrera had released and which had been redirected. Esprit couldn't help but admire her master Carrera, who had seen through the enemy's manipulation of her magic the moment it disappeared. Carrera called it a basic move and asked Esprit and Geld if their protective barrier could withstand the attack. At that moment, Meline also deployed a barrier stating that if the castle was destroyed, Frey would be furious. The destructive energy mass descended from the rift. By now, even Frey and the others understood what had happened. Peleid had first sent Carrera's magic to the other world and then connected the spatial transfer's exit to the sky above Malim's castle. This outrageous maneuver left Frey, Carrion, and Midray stunned. Gabru, among those present, was the only one who didn't grasp what had occurred but he couldn't be blamed. It was hard to believe that someone had managed to send back primordial yellow Carrera's strongest nuclear magic. With no time for further explanations, everyone braced themselves for the attack. Moments later, a powerful impact struck Malim's castle. Intense light waves flickered, the ground seemed to shift, and different forces intertwined before the shockwaves slowly subsided and quieted down. Seeing her abyss annihilation neutralized, Carrera finally calmed down, admitting that she hadn't expected the enemy to possess such abilities. 
She remarked that they would have been in serious trouble if it had been Malim's magic. Upon hearing this, everyone turned pale. The shockwave they had just neutralized had already been reduced to about 30% of its original power, so they had barely managed to hold their ground without any casualties. Despite this, the terrain surrounding the castle had suffered significant destruction. But what if it had been Malim's Drago Nova? Malim maintained a relaxed attitude, stating that her magic wasn't so easily controlled. She observed that the magic sent back at them had only a fraction of its original power. However, Carrera seriously remarked that even if it was only a fraction, she didn't have confidence in withstanding Malim's magic. This was because the nature of Malim's magic was fundamentally different from the magic Carrera understood. It was entirely based on an unknown realm, making it impossible to rewrite its laws. As someone who constantly competed with Malim regarding magical power, Carrera understood the dangers of Malim's magic better than anyone. To explain further, Malim's magic was true dragon magic. Malim possessed Veldanava's dragon factors within her, enabling her to use dragon magic. This was why Carrera couldn't comprehend Malim's magic. Similarly, Velzard, Velgrind, and Veldora each had their corresponding true dragon magic. Rimuru, Michael, and later Felway, who also possessed dragon factors, could also use true dragon magic. However, Gabra voiced another question that was on everyone's mind. Since Malim's magic was based on an unknown realm, the enemy might also be unable to throw Malim's magic back at them. Malim confirmed that it could indeed be thrown back because the opponent was extraordinarily skilled in spatial domination, likely achieved through significantly enhanced calculation abilities. No matter the magic, Peleid could easily alter its trajectory as long as it was directional. Carrera agreed albeit reluctantly. She deduced that the enemy was even more adept at handling more extensive and more complex spells. Even with a pinpoint attack like a nuclear flame, Peleid could predict the activation point and slice through that space, rendering the magic ineffective. To avoid a counterattack, they must cast instantaneous spells that leave no time to react. However, such spells wouldn't be able to deliver a fatal blow. This realization infuriated Carrera. It felt like her innate demonic mastery over magic had been stolen by the enemy. Having a foe skilled in magic was proving to be a significant problem. Although Abra hadn't taken action, she was deeply regretful, thinking that she could have prepared more effectively if she had understood these insectars better. However, the group remained as relaxed as ever, reassuring Abra that there was no point in dwelling on past events. They emphasized that, regardless of the situation, Carrera's attack had already been a great success. The fact was that they had killed two million insect armies with no casualties and tested one of the insect general's key abilities. More importantly, the soldiers below the sky castle, unaware of the specific circumstances, only knew that their side had withstood the attack while the enemy suffered heavy losses. This boosted their morale significantly, making it the perfect opportunity to strike back at the enemy. Considering Peleid's presence, they decided not to use magic attacks moving forward. The insect army had eight generals and Malim's side also had eight generals. The battle plan was straightforward. Apart from Malim, Abra, and Esprit, everyone picked an opponent and led their troops out of the castle, kicking off the battle. Leading the charge was primordial yellow Carrera. Carrera's fearless nature made her perfect for spearheading the attack. She quickly spotted Zess, Zijin's brother, sitting arrogantly on the back of a flying insectoid. Zess was second only to insect Lord Zelenus among the insect generals and was a troublesome opponent even for Zelario. Carrera punched and kicked her way through countless insect soldiers, breaking through the battlefield swiftly. Without hesitation, she drew her golden handgun and fired at the composed Zess as soon as she reached him. However, to Zess, even a point-blank supersonic bullet was as insignificant as a toy. He easily dodged the bullet and looked at Carrera. Carrera felt a twinge of excitement and transformed her golden handgun into a gleaming gold saber. She declared that she would be the one to end Zess's life. Zess, with disdain, replied that she should try to make him stand up from his mount first. And so, their battle began. Charging out of the castle alongside Carrera to face the enemy was Frey. 
After defeating numerous flying insects, Frey confronted Torin, a two-meter-tall insect general with a body encased in a metallic exoskeleton. Despite his bulky appearance, Torin possessed exceptional flight and combat abilities. He used his dragonfly-like wings to fly with agility, and his compound eyes could easily track Frey's movements and predict her actions. Torin had no special powers, but his strength came from the durability of his exoskeleton, his ability to foresee movements, and his flight speed. His fists, made of the special material Aeonium, were stronger than adamantite and comparable to mythical weapons. Despite having lower existence points than Frey, Torin's reaction speed, defense, and attack power surpassed hers. Frey initially planned to defeat Torin with sheer momentum but struggled due to her misjudgment. Torin, with a mocking grin, taunted Frey about her speed, saying it was far too slow compared to his. This provocation enraged Frey, unleashing even greater combat strength. After the war, Melim commented that Frey was not the forgiving type and would make anyone who spoke foolishly regret it, a lesson Torin was about to learn firsthand. This is the first time the book uses Melim's post-battle perspective to evaluate Frey, indicating that the battle ended in a decisive victory for Rimura's side. Now, let's look at Gabru. Gabra led 200 Hiria subordinates following Frey, reminding them they would face powerful insect-type monsters, the same race as Zijin and Apito, and extremely strong. Gabru, having frequently trained with Apito in the labyrinth, remained cautious and alert. While advancing, Gabru and his subordinates encountered a formidable insect general, Beat Hop, who had characteristics of both a bee and a locust. Beat Hop's aura was similar to Apito's but much more malevolent. Like Torin, Beat Hop's limbs were covered in an exoskeleton that had evolved into Aeonium. Gabru's strength was close to Apito's, with their training sessions often ending in draws. Facing such a strong enemy, Gabru realized it was unwise to risk his life in a battle against such a formidable opponent. Unlike many of the Monster Federation's executives, Gabru was not particularly combative. Despite his fierce appearance, he was very kind-hearted. However, avoiding the opponent was impossible, as Beat Hop instantly approached Gabru and launched a kick, forcing Gabru to engage. Gabru, accustomed to Apito's speed from their training in the labyrinth, and armed with the near-mythical Vortex Spear, managed to withstand the impact of the kick. Introducing himself as Drag Lord under Rimurasama, Gabru made up his mind to confront the enemy. Switching perspectives to Carrion, he was sprinting across the ground, closely pursued by an insect general named Abarth, who resembled a spider. As mentioned before, Carrion became exceptionally powerful after his awakening. If he were to use his burst roar, as he did in his labyrinth training, Abarth would likely have been eliminated already. Carrion didn't do this because there were other insect generals present, and he couldn't reveal his trump card too soon. Carrion needed to conserve his strength and prepare for the subsequent battles ahead. At the same time, Midray encountered Serral, an insect general who appeared to be a venomous scorpion. Serral's body was covered in toxic liquid, with an exoskeleton that gleamed with a purple-red hue. His most notable feature was the deadly poison seeping from his tail, and he was confident that his venom could kill any strong opponent who touched it. Serral would be a highly challenging adversary for those who excel in close combat, but Midray did not have this problem. Serral mocked Midray for being unlucky, but Midray retorted that luck did not exist in battle. Victory came from constant effort and training. He then demonstrated his instantaneous movement technique, closing the distance and striking Serral, sending him flying. Midray's fist undoubtedly came into contact with Serral's venom, but he was unconcerned as he was protected by a combat aura shield that prevented the poison from penetrating. Serral was shocked by Midray's strength, unable to believe that a mere human possessed such power. Midray explained that as Malim Sama's companion, he needed to have this level of skill. Despite Serral's confidence in his own victory, he underestimated Midray. In reality, Midray, like Gabaru, was a dragonut, with existence points twice that of Gabaru. Midray usually concealed his true strength through his battle will. Now Midray would demonstrate his abilities in front of Serral. Switching perspectives to Geld, who had just returned to the front lines, 
he cautioned his subordinates that their mission was to ensure no enemy passed through their position. Geld's subordinates, facing the advancing insect army, were fearless and highly motivated. Geld noticed that the insect-like monsters came in various forms, but the closer they were to a human shape, the stronger they were. At the same time, Geld's gaze locked onto an enemy commander, a gigantic centipede over thirty meters long, ridden by an insect general named Majika. This warrior-type insect demon was covered in a gaudy, armor-like exoskeleton and wielded a katana in both hands. Geld steeled himself, ready to face the enemy. Esprit drew her weapon, a legendary straight sword. Melim realized that Esprit was also preparing for battle. Esprit worried that her strength was too weak and might hold everyone back, so she planned to assess the situation before acting. However, her lord Carrera was already in a tough fight. On the one hand, Carrera's opponent, Zess, was mighty. On the other hand, Peleid was constantly interfering, trying to block Carrera's magic, forcing her into a purely defensive stance. Esprit's involvement would undoubtedly alleviate Carrera's disadvantage. Although her contribution might be limited, the enemies didn't adhere to one-on-one -on -one combat rules, so action was necessary. Esprit had always believed that practicing anything other than magic was a waste of time for demons. Still, recently, influenced by her lord Carrera and colleague Ajura, she secretly started practicing swordsmanship. Despite the short training period, which wasn't sufficient for actual combat, this enemy had excellent anti-magic capabilities, making it the perfect time for swordsmanship to shine. Thus, Esprit joined the battle. At the same time, Abra locked onto her target, an agile insect general named Tizhan, whose hands could transform into sharp blades. Abra declared that her injuries had healed and would quickly defeat her opponent to support her comrades. She also sensed Zelenus's presence, a powerful and oppressive aura hidden behind the battlefield, seemingly enveloping the entire area. Only her lord, Melim Sama, could handle Zelenus. Melim ordered Abra into the battle and encouraged her, filling Abra with genuine joy. Unlike previous obligatory fights, she now felt a surge of strength from within. Abra also understood the sentiment of the 300,000 phantom soldiers who sacrificed themselves to protect her. She inherited their will and fearlessly stepped onto the battlefield. All right, that's all for this video. The setup phase of the Tenma Great War has come to an end, and the exciting battles will begin in the next episode. Although Rimuru and Michael are the strongest individuals on both sides of the war, surprisingly, the two engage in a decisive battle at the very beginning of the war, which is also one of the climax points of the entire series. The next episode might be our most content-packed one so far. Firstly, Rimura once again sets his sights on Hinata, wanting to see her beautiful body. Secondly, we'll summarize the situations on various battlefields and Rimura's action plan accordingly. Then, De Gruel would get defeated by Fen and awaken his long-forgotten memories. Finally, the enemy's leader, Manus Michael, would appear, instantly defeating Diablo and throwing Rimuru and his companions into a panic. Michael's strength is far beyond expectations. The next episode is going to be very exciting. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Your support is greatly appreciated. See you in the next one.